speaker of the afternoon is Derek Remish, who is a double doctoral student at Eastman, pursuing a PhD in music theory and a DMA in organ. He studied organ with David Hicks for four years, earning the MM in organ in 2014 and the performer certificate in 2015. He now studies organ with Eduardo Velotti with an emphasis on historical improvisation. Derek's research interests include partimenti, fugue, musical rhetoric, and theory pedagogy. He presented his research at the Music Theory Society of New York State in 2016. An active composer, Derek earned BM degrees in composition and film scoring from Berklee College of Music in 2010. He began studying organ privately in 2011 with Catherine Rodland and was a second prize winner in the Albert Schweitzer Organ Competition in 2013. He currently serves as organist and choir director at St. Thomas More Church in Rochester. Today, he'll be talking to us about J.S. Bach's organ chorale accompaniment, reconstructing late 18th century German practices in light of a new source. Derek Remich. So the last talk of the last day <laughs> seems good reason to get right to the point. <laughs> if you take home one fact from my talk, let it be this. The Bach harmonizations so common in American hymnals were not intended as accompaniments. <laughs> How then did Bach and his students accompany chorales? The goal of this presentation is to answer this question. Robin A. Lieber has recently identified a long overlooked source dubbed the Sibley Chorale Book as originating from J.S. Bach's circle of pupils in Dresden from between 1730 and 1740. The anonymous manuscript contains 226 chorales with figured bass arranged according to the liturgical year. Lieber argues that the Sibley Chorale book served both practical and pedagogical functions, so acting as a reference for organists to play from during the church service, as well as a repository of chorales for Bach's students to harmonize. C.P.E. Bach confirms that chorale harmonization played a central role in his father's pedagogy with students first supplying inner voices to a given outer voice framework. In this presentation, I aim to reconstruct how Bach's students might have realized the figured bass chorales in the Sibley Chorale book. I argue that Bach's published four voice chorales, those which appear in American hymnals, are poor models because they are vocal, not keyboard works. Instead, I will focus on three late 18th century German authors who offer a variety of strategies for realizing figured bass chorales, ranging from four voices in simple chords to complex ornamented textures. In this context, the Sibley Chorale book suggests that, contrary to popular belief, Bach's accompaniment and his pedagogy began in a simpler keyboard style. <coughs> Example one provides the chorale, Nun lasst uns Gott den Herren, from the Sibley Chorale book. All chorales in the manuscript are set in this way with outer voices and figures. Such settings match C.P.E. Bach's description that his father began students with figured bass chorales to which the students supplied inner voices and later their own bass lines. This pedagogical progression leads naturally to the multiple bass tradition mentioned by Dr. Lieber in his keynote address. Example two transcribes example one into modern notation. 
The mostly simple, largely diatonic keyboard settings, or uh, keyboard style settings in the Sibley Chorale book bear little resemblance to the rich complexity of Bach's vocal chorales. To illustrate, compare example two with Bach's vocal setting of the same tune from Cantata 165 in example three. Comparing the two settings, we note the frequent passing tones, chromaticism, and suspensions that permeate example three, as well as the shortened note values, which may or may not imply a faster tempo. Example three is the type of setting we are accustomed to seeing in American hymnals. Such settings originated mostly in Bach's cantatas and were originally written for choir, not as organ accompaniments. C.P.E. Bach confirms this, writing in the preface to the initial 1765 edition of his father's chorales that he reduced them from four staves to two to make them easier to read at the keyboard. C.P.E. makes special note of the, quote, natural flow of the inner voices and bass, which are above all what distinguish these chorales, end quote. Indeed, the richness of these settings is in stark contrast to most contemporary chorale books, which were in a simpler keyboard style, like the Sibley Chorale book. Many authorities in Bach's day considered his vocal chorales unsuitable for congregational accompaniment. According to Matthew Durst, CPE's first edition of his father's chorales sold poorly and was, quote, controversial even among admirers who questioned their style and utility while praising their creator's master, uh, mastery of harmony, end quote. For example, in the preface to his chorale book of 1786, Johann Christoph Kuhnau acknowledges Bach's settings as masterpieces, but considers them too difficult and inappropriate for church. Abbe Vogler and Karl Maria von Weber even deplore Bach's chorale's lack of noble simplicity and dignity. Therefore, since the complexity of Bach's vocal chorales represents a departure from common practice, we should not automatically assume they were suitable models, or they are suitable models, for the Sibley Chorale book. Lever has argued that there was another keyboard-based Bach chorale tradition, which ran parallel to the vocal chorale tradition. The keyboard-based tradition, centering around pedagogy and congregational accompaniment, remains largely hidden today because it was mostly improvised. The Sibley Chorale book offers insight into this neglected tradition, but, as already noted, the figure-based chorales are unrealized. The key to unlocking this code lies in the published advice of 18th century German authors. I will focus on three writers from the second half of the 18th century. They are Michael Wiedeburg, Justin Heinrich Knecht, and Johann Gottlob Werner. Judging by their comments and musical examples, all three authors were influenced in part by Gallant ideas, that is, in the generation after Bach. Nevertheless, the fact that their works were published in or near Leipzig in the 50 or so years after Bach's death makes them particularly relevant to the present discussion, which includes Bach's circle of pupils in Dresden. That is, the three pupils from Dresden are his son, Wilhelm Friedemann, Gottfried August Cornelius, and Christian Heinrich Grebner. Because time is short, please refer to the bibliography at the end of the handout for titles uh, and dates of the Wiedeburg, Knecht, and Werner publications. None of their works are available in English, so all translations are my own. Before diving into these sources, I want to re-emphasize that the purpose of exploring these three authors is to illuminate the Sibley Chorale book, which very likely comes from the Bach circle. First, we will discuss advice about organ playing, as tabulated in example four. Werner notes that large numbers of uneducated singers 
usually pull the pitch very flat. The twofold purpose of organ accompaniment, then, is to help the singers maintain proper pitch, as well as, quote, to make the simple tunes more beautiful and uplifting by filling out the harmony, end quote. Werner says that the chorale melody must be presented purely and without alteration, and admonishes organists who try to showcase their own technical ability. Knecht advises that the chorale melody be placed in the top voice so that it projects clearly and the congregation can hear it easily. This is called the Kentsunala style. Werner writes that, quote, in some uneducated areas, one always finds singers who, led by nature, sing a middle or bass voice against the melody. That is, a third, fifth, sixth, or octave, end quote. I think we will experience uh, how easy it is to do that, both when we sing in a few moments and at the concert tonight. Given the, the massive sound that comes from the Cascarini, it's easy to just pick out any chord tone. Therefore, says Werner, the organist must avoid foreign and unusual harmonies. According to Werner, the organist may play so that the congregation becomes accustomed to singing in at least three parts, but this is impossible if the singers are confused by unnatural dissonances. Now he makes a difference. He says, with an educated congregation, various alterations may be allowed in the playing of chorales. Rather than playing eight to ten verses all the same way, Quote, a purposeful and careful variation in, in harmony can bring much to good expression. End quote. That is, consonant chords are better for joyful texts, and dissonant suspensions are better for sorrowful ones. Werner assumes that the organist is responsible for and capable of transposing chorales to fit the congregation's vocal range. Middle C up to F an octave higher, or F2, are the lowest and highest allowable pitches. And, Werner says, one must remember that organs are tuned a whole step higher in core tone. Furthermore, due to faulty intonation, some organs are very impure in certain keys, such as B or F sharp. Solemn, plaintive melodies require a lower key. Spirited, joyful songs require a higher key and middle keys are best for gentle chorales. Werner warns that, quote, setting the chorale too high can often result in a disturbing, repugnant shouting, which is generally accompanied by a sagging of pitch, end quote. <laughs> Regarding tempo, Werner says, and this is a longer quote, it is not good when the chorales are too slow and drawn out but it is worse yet when they are sung too quickly. The middle road is surely the best. The worst fault is when the organist deviates from the adopted tempo, lingering for longer or shorter time at the end of a line, or playing one line slower, the next faster, so that the singers soon drag and eventually stop singing. The tempo of a song can be taken a little faster or slower, depending on its content. End quote. Knecht agrees that festive songs are played faster, whereas plaintive songs are played slower. Werner's advice about registration is unusual, since he recommends using full organ and full chords for weak congregations. In contrast, Wiedeborg allows for fewer stops and thinner chords when accompanying smaller groups. See example four under registration. Here is a long quote from Werner where he discusses registration. He says, the organist must remain aware of the weakness and strength of the chorale accompaniment so that the organ and the song always maintain proper balance. In this respect, one must be mindful of the greater or lesser number of singers as well as the content of the song. With weak congregations, the organist always plays with full organ, and
and as full voiced as possible. Thus, the organ covers the singing, and the singers become accustomed to the organ's mixture stops. He makes a point of the mixture stops. On the other hand, with an accompaniment that is too weak, the singers often go under pitch. A stronger accompaniment is applicable for a song that is full of glad, lively sentiments or with an unfamiliar melody. Now this next part is funny. He says what not to do. Some organists accompany the first verse with full verk, the ensuing ones progressively softer, including one with pedal alone, and the last verse again with all possible clamoring. To say that this is a baleful habit requires no evidence. <laughs> Through the skillful use of registration, wherein admittedly an accurate knowledge of organ building is required, the organist can express much to his accompaniment, so long as he doesn't fall into violence. End quote. Knecht advises that the first verse be natural, simple, and not too artful. The progression of the bass should be bass-like, imagine that, moderate, and majestic. And with multiple strophes, variations can be made as long as the organist is capable and the congregation has enough strength of tone. Now we will discuss these authors' strategies for realizing a figured bass, as collated in example five. Uh, we will work through this example from left to right. The older method, which was still very common in 1800, is the close style. I call this type one. To play this way, Werner says, and this is a long quote, one grabs three voices with the right hand, the soprano, alto, and tenor, and simply plays the bass with the left hand. One finds many such settings in the oldest chorale books. But this way of accompanying chorales is not properly suited to, suitable to human voices, since the first three voices, especially the alto and tenor, usually lie too close together and are too far from the bass. Furthermore, the pleasing middle range of the organ lies unused, and the pedal merely goes along with the left hand in unison." End quote. Knecht also describes the close style as the most basic and easiest way of playing in four voices. Knecht notes with condescension that four-voice chorale books without figured bass are for beginners who follow the notes blindly without any knowledge of harmony. Example six on page six provides Knecht's illustration of the close style using the same chorale as examples one, two, and three, but transposed to C major. The newer way of playing chorales is with spread harmony. I call this type two in example five. According to Werner, beginning organists should play with spread harmony, but completely abstaining from all ornamentation. Knecht and Werner say that the spread style is superior to the close style because the middle voices and uh, because the middle voices are an appropriate distance from one another as they are when sung by human voices. According to Werner, in the spread style of accompaniment, the organist usually takes the soprano and alto with the right hand, the tenor with the left, and the pedal plays the bass voice. He says, the pedal, which is a crucial part of the organ and surpasses all other instruments in splendor and dignity, also receives its own voice, end quote. This would seem to imply that the manual to pedal coupler is either not present or remains unengaged. Knecht offers example seven on page six as an illustration of the spread style. The tenor voice of example seven is a near exact octave transposition of the alto voice in example six. Type three in example five, termed the ornamented style, is a variation of type two. Knecht notes that 
Some musicians think we don't have the right to rob the chorale of its simplicity. Recall the critiques of Bach's vocal chorales as lacking in noble simplicity. But, Knecht says, variations are necessary to avoid monotony. Knecht describes various types of ornamentation, which I label 3.1, 3.2, etc., at the bottom of example 5. In type 3.1, one may alter only the bass and the harmony. Please skip ahead to example 10 on page 8 for Knecht's illustration of this technique. It's example 10, page 8. Alternatively, in type 3.2, one may add figuration to the middle voices as well as the bass, as shown in example 11a, b, and c. The third manner, type 3.3, applies ornamentation to all voices, including the melody itself, as shown in example 12a and b on page 9. Knecht advises adding gentle figuration to the melody when accompanying a small choir, that's example 12a, and virtuosic figuration when accompanying a large congregation, that's 12b. One may also alternate an adorned melody with other types of accompaniment. In contrast to Knecht, Werner cautions that one rarely ornaments the melody itself and then only on well-known chorales. Finally, type 3.4 encompasses all types of imitative counterpoint applied to the chorale accompaniment. Imitation appears scattered throughout example 15, which we will examine in a moment. Back to, I keep turning back to example five. So the full voiced style, or type four in example five, is yet another way of realizing a figure based chorale. Wiederborg says that this style consists of playing three to four voices in each hand, filling in the vacuum, as Wiederborg says, between the soprano and the bass, but, and this is critical, without regard for parallel fifths or octaves. <laughs> as long as the outer voices move in good counterpoint, the inner voices may have parallels. For the sake of clarity on the organ, Wiederborg says, one should usually leave out fifths and thirds in the lowest octave of the keyboard, especially when there is a 16-foot stop drawn in the manuals. For large congregations, one pulls many stops and plays with as many as nine voices. That's four in each hand plus pedal. With smaller congregations, one pulls fewer stops and plays with four to five voices. Werner also advises using the full voiced style when a large congregation begins to sink in pitch, as well as with festive or sublime texts. Example eight on page seven shows Knecht's model for the full voiced style again using the tune, Nun lasst uns Gott in heaven. Note how Knecht's setting adheres to Wiedeborg's advice by having larger intervals in the lower register. Knecht cautions, however, that the full-voiced style of accompaniment obscures the melody, and he suggests a variation where rests are added on beats two and four while the melody sustains in the soprano. This technique is shown in example nine, which is my own arrangement, in alternation with Werner's unison style, or type five. He says unison octaves are useful with unfamiliar melodies and on festive occasions, and unison may be used for a line or even an entire verse. In sum, types one through five in example five are viable options for realizing the chorales in the Sibley Chorale book. In order to compare these various styles of accompaniment, I would like to pause now and do some singing. After a four-measure introduction, 
we will sing examples 6 through 9 on pages 6 and 7 together in German. To facilitate comparison between these five textures, the registration will remain constant at full organ with manual 16 throughout. Chelsea, our organist, will play down a whole step in B flat major, which will sound in B major on this organ. I made this adjustment because Werner says F2 is the highest allowable pitch, and the Casparini is in chord mode. Please stand and sing example 6 through 9 on page, pages 6 and 7.
Knecht mentions yet another variation on the full voiced style, which is more difficult to write and to play. It consists of five or six independent ornamented voices with parallels forbidden. He offers examples 13 and 14 on page 10 as models. One imagines that this sort of improvisation would represent a high point in a student's training, having begun with harmonizations in the close style. So, how does all of this fit together regarding the Sibley Chorale book? Example 15, which consists of six verses on pages 11 through 16, is Werner's summative demonstration of chorale accompaniment in his Orgelschule. It is unique for at least two reasons. First, it is the only publication I know of from this time that includes different harmonizations linked with specific verses. This allows us to speculate about text-music relationships, given that Werner believed strongly that the text should inform the accompaniment. For instance, verse 4 on page 14 calls, or it speaks of calling on the Lord when in need in measure 4, marked with an arrow. Werner uses a reduced registration and tonicizes the supertonic minor on the word note, or distress. This marks the first significant harmonic variation of the opening phrase. A full translation of all six verses in example 15 is given in example 16 at the end of the handout for your further text music speculation. The second unique feature of this setting is its specificity. It contains different Zwischenspiele for each verse along with registration and pedal indications. It is important to remember that Zwischenspiele would have been included when Bach's students accompanied from the Sibley Chorale book. Note that Werner occasionally ornaments the chorale itself. I marked these places with rhythms above the text. Since the congregation in his day could not have anticipated these, th th this ornamentation, they would probably have continued to sing the original ornament unornamented values. Professor David Higgs will accompany the singing of the entire set of six verses in example 15 at the concert tonight at 8 p.m. here at Christchurch. A separate English handout will be provided. <laughs> I look forward to discussing Werner's setting with you individually after the concert. So to return to our framing question, how did Bach and his students accompany chorales? As we have seen, there are multiple answers to this question. Returning to example five on page five, we recall that the close style is easiest to play, but it neglects the organ's middle register and is not ideal for singing in parts. The spread style addresses these issues, but cannot be used for too many verses without becoming monotonous. For variety, ornamentation, may be applied to the bass line, the middle voices, or even the chorale melody itself. The full-voiced style of accompaniment is ideal for large congregations and festive occasions, while unison octaves can provide textural contrast. The Sibley Chorale book lies at the intersection of the pedagogical and liturgical function of the chorale in Bach's day. It also documents the existence of a largely improvised, keyboard-based Bach chorale tradition, which ran concurrent to the vocal chorale tradition. The richly ornamented textures of Bach's vocal chorales were the exception rather than the rule in late, teen, late 18th century German congregational accompaniment. <laughs> Complex ornamentation was only one of many possible strategies with a simpler chordal style being more common, both in Bach's accompaniment and his pedagogy. 
Like organists of Bach's day, we should not merely accept what's printed in the hymnal. Rather, we should seek variety in our hymn accompaniments, playing chorales, as Bach said to one student, not offhand, but according to the affect of the words. Thank you. point. So the comment is that uh, example nine would, um, problems would be exacerbated by unsteady wind, typical of the era. That's a great question. We've experimented with that in the organ colloquium here and found it to be very effective when the right foot is doubling the melody in the tenor range. The answer is, at this point, not that I know of. I haven't come across any mentions of playing the melody with the right foot. 